Welcome back to World War I. For this lecture, we're going to be focusing on the American response, both how they got drawn into the war as well as how they responded both militarily as well as on the home front. A review of the previous lecture. Europe entered into World War I because of a variety of reasons. Nationalism, putting your nation's interests above that of the world. Militarism, using your military as a form of diplomacy. And the domino effect of alliances. Remember, we had the Allies versus the Central Powers, or the Triple Alliance. It was called the War to End All Wars, not just because the hope was that this global war would be the last of its kind, but also the type of warfare that was fought. Trench warfare with no man's land. Mechanized weapons that relied on gasoline and machine guns, airplanes, the Zeppelin, and also chemical warfare, such as chlorine and mustard gas. Americans tried to remain neutral as Europe entered into war. Despite having um, somewhat of an alliance with Europe, or with the Allies more so than the Central Powers, Americans truly tried to stay out of the war. Wilson will actually win the election of 1916 on that promise. He kept us out of war. Unfortunately, he won't be able to uphold it. So let's focus on how the United States gets involved. Neutrality collapsed. Wilson tried to end the war by saying neither side would impose harsh terms and that they would join a league for peace, a way to extend democracy and maintain freedom of the seas. The Germans responded by declaring that all ships, hostile or neutral, around British shores would be sunk. Remember, this is not only in direct violation of the Sussex Pledge, as we talked about in the previous lecture, but it's also a direct violation of rules of warfare. If a ship is neutral, especially if it's only carrying passengers and not military weapons, it should be protected under the rules of war. The Germans have now declared all ships to be the enemy, thus drawing the Americans in. So the Overt Act. As we've talked about before, Americans often want a legitimate reason to enter into war, not just because they think it's good. So the first one is the Zimmerman Note. This is a telegram from the German foreign minister to the German ambassador in Mexico. It suggested that if Mexico were to supply Germany, that if Germany were to enter the war with the United States and Germany won, they would give land back to Mexico. This, of course, concerned us since a third of our country was land we had taken from the Mexicans in both the Texas Revolution as well as the Mexican-American War. Additionally, four unarmed American merchant ships were sunk. 336 lives were lost. Now, this doesn't include the Lusitania. Though the Lusitania brought up our awareness of freedom of the seas, it was not a direct overt act that got us involved in the war. Additionally, with the Bolshevik Revolution, Russia becomes a representative government. It is now the democracies against the Brunel monarchies. At this point, we're going to use that as an excuse. Later on, we're going to look at the Russians as a communist nation and be concerned about them with the Red Scare that's going to come after World War I. But at this point, we'll be only focusing on them as a representative government. So, on April, in April 1917, Wilson will go before Congress and ask for a de declaration of war, which he will receive. The month later, they will pass the Selective Service Act. This will be, have a draft, there are no riots, and mostly because it's a more equitable draft. Unlike the Civil War, where you could buy your way out of the draft, you couldn't do so in World War I. Men 21 to 23, the average person who served was a man 21 to 23, single, no high school education, and one out of five were foreign born. Their training would last about nine months, 17 hour days, using imaginary weapons. We weren't supplied for war. We weren't ready to go to war. And so we didn't even have enough weapons to necessarily send with our American expeditionary force as they went over to Europe, nevertheless to train them. How did women respond to the war effort? They were not drafted. The Navy accepted them for non-combat positions, such as nurses, secretaries, and telephone operators, where they received full rank. The Army had the Army Corps of Nurses. This is a continuation of the United States Sanitary Commission that we learned about during the Civil War, but they got no rank, no pay, or benefits. They helped hasten the passage of the 19th Amendment. See, women are going to serve in these, com these non-combat positions for the armed forces, but they're also going to serve in factories. They're going to serve in government positions. They're going to keep the farms work going as men go off to war. 
they're going to be an essential part of keeping the home front going as the war is going on. Because of this, their commitment to the home front and to the war effort will help make recognition of the women's suffrage movement possible. African Americans will serve in segregated units. Some black officers, though mostly white, most in non-combat duties. The most famous of these is the 369th Infantry Regiment, which saw more continuous duty on the front lines than any other regiment. At home, most are going to support the war. The Great Migration is a big movement during this time. Thousands are going to move to the cities from r the rural south for the j jobs in the war industry. You have to know the Great Migration. You have to know the impact that it's going to have. You're going to see a dramatic shift in the African American population from the rural south to the cities. This is going to have a huge impact on the 1920s, where you see the rise of the Harlem Renaissance as a response to this uniting of culture after World War I. The American Navy was built up to support Britain and to try to fight Germany. One of the ways they tried to do this was with the convoy system. This is where merchant vessels traveled in large groups with a guard of circling destroyers. You can see a picture of this here. They also set up a mine barrier and submarine chasers to try to defeat the German Navy. The American Army provided numbers, freshness, and enthusiasm. They were called the American Expeditionary Force. At first, they were replacements for other Allied casualties. But in April 1918, they're going to begin to fight as an independent force. This is going to change how the war is being fought, and it's also going to give Americans a voice at the peace table. When you're simply sending in 10, 15, 20 men at a time to replace French or British soldiers, you don't have as much of a staying power as you do when you're bringing in entire regiments to fight in major battles. Some of the war heroes who you should recognize from this war, uh, American war heroes, John Jack, Black Jack Pershing, who is the commander of the American Expeditionary Force, Eddie Rickenbacker, who was the ace of the skies, and Alvin York, who was the most decorated soldier from World War I. Some of the things that you also might need to know about is some of the medical care that arose during this time. One is shell shock, which is the complete emotional collapse. Another thing is trench foot, wet feet that for a long period are where your foot was wet for a long period of time. Your foot turns red or blue, and then it would become numb and eventually rot off. So I hate to reference Forrest Gump, but I'm going to here. When Forrest Gump first goes to Vietnam, he's told to keep his feet dry and his socks clean. There's a reason for that. It's not just because we want people not to have smelly feet. It's because of trench foot. And realizing that you needed to keep your feet dry to keep them from developing blisters and this uh, rot, we're going to see that being translated both into World War II, but especially into Vietnam when they're fighting in the jungle. The Red Cross is going to be instrumental during this time. The International Red Cross, which of course comes from the American Red Cross, created by Clara Barton during the Civil War. So what's going on at home? At home, the, we have the War Industries Board, which created weapons and supplies, and also decided how um, factories would turn from peacetime production to wartime production. You have the National War Labor Board, which settled disputes between management and labor. Labor is going to get a lot of conditions during the war in order to keep the war going. And then you have the Committee on Public Information. This is the nation's first propaganda agency. It's going to publish thousands of documents, posters, things like the one up in the corner, suggesting that people on the home front garden so that they don't have to buy food and that that food could then go to the uh, military. Some other propaganda is here. A lot of you guys have probably seen a lot of World War II propaganda, but actually World War I was an amazing propaganda machine. A lot of it was towards the war effort, whereas with World War II, we have a lot of criticism of our enemy. World War I was being more patriotic. So things like don't stop saving food, help deliver the goods, be patriotic and sign your country's pledge to save food. Eat more cottage cheese. You'll need less meat because, of course, cottage cheese have a lot of protein. Things like that. There was an anti-immigrant hysteria. Immigrants from Germany and Austria-Hungary faced a lot of criticism. Um, we also passed something called the Espionage and Sedition Acts. People could be fined up to $10,000 
and or sentenced to 20 years in jail for interfering with the draft, obstruction of the sale of government bonds, or say saying anything disloyal about the government or the war effort. This is very similar to the Alien Sedition Acts of John Adams' presidency. But now it's really focused on a war effort. You have to realize that things like this get held up in times of war because the consideration is if it is going to protect national security, a violation of civil liberties is allowed. Remember, Abraham Lincoln was able to suspend due process during the Civil War in order to protect the nation. So how does the war end? Well, eventually the Germans actually give up. November 3, 1918, sailors and marines refused to fight. By November 9, 1918, the people of Berlin actually rise up in rebellion, and the Kaiser advocates. At this point, with the German people turning against their government and in the war effort declining, we're going to see an armistice come. And so, on the 11th month of the 11th, or the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918, at 11 a.m., a ceasefire will end the war. This will be an armistice, a ceasefire. We will have a treaty that will come afterwards, which will sort of wrap up all the loose pieces. And that will be the focus of our next lecture.